there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Chinese television and newspapers brag this week that the Chinese PLA has awesome power to strike American cities with nuclear missiles launched by Chinese submarines. Military videos and photographs have appeared on TV news programs and in newspapers this week in China, touting the communist nation's growing military might and a future war with the United States. The images have appeared on China Central TV, the People's Daily Newspaper, the PLA Daily, the China Youth Daily, and the Global Times. The Global Times published a lengthy article titled, China, for the first time, possesses effective underwater nuclear deterrence against the United States. The article includes 30 photographs and graphics showing the damage that Seattle, Washington, and Los Angeles, California would suffer after being hit by Chinese nuclear warheads launched by stealth submarines. The article boasted that the West Coast radiation would be carried by the wind to Chicago. The Chinese news report said the PLA missiles will not target the U.S. Midwest, but strike the densely populated West Coast. In addition to Seattle and Los Angeles, the Chinese news media said San Francisco and San Diego will be targeted for destruction, killing or injuring up to 12 million Americans. The Chinese newspaper said that Chinese ICBMs launched over the North Pole will easily obliterate New England and much of the East Coast, including Annapolis, Maryland, home of the U.S. Naval Academy, Baltimore, Maryland, home of the NSA, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, Portland, Maine, and Norfolk, Virginia, the biggest naval port in America, an estimated 34,000 Japanese troops, naval destroyers, and fighter jets are scheduled to take part in a large-scale military exercise scheduled to end on November 18. The drills are aimed at China and will take place on air, sea, and land, and will include live fire exercises and amphibious landings on a deserted island. Japan has been taking a more aggressive, hawkish stand as tensions escalate between Tokyo and Beijing, especially over the disputed chain of the Senkaku Islands. Various Asian news outlets reported that a Chinese Navy spy ship has recently been positioned off the coast of Hawaii. The move is seen as Beijing's retaliation against growing U.S. naval presence in the South China Sea and American participation in war drills with Japan and South Korea. The Asian American news source GoldSea.com reported that a Chinese People's Liberation Army electronic reconnaissance ship loaded with electronic gear for eavesdropping on American communications in Hawaii and the surrounding Pacific Sea, recently sailed through the U.S. uh, 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. 
Uh, there is no indication that the Chinese spy ship violated the U.S. 12 nautical mile territorial water zone. The GoldSea.com uh, reported that the Chinese Navy ship got within 2,400 miles of San Francisco, and that represents a potential for offensive military action against the United States. Meanwhile, two Russian Tu-160 Blackjack strategic nuclear bombers that landed in Venezuela earlier this week patrolled the Caribbean Sea yesterday and landed in Nicaragua in Central America. At, at this point, I'm going to stop my newscast, and I'm just going to speak uh, to you from my heart, because I'm feeling prompted in my Holy Spirit to just dispense with the rest of the newscast. What I just reported to you is chilling enough, and we really don't need to go on with anything else, if you comprehend what I just reported. Need I repeat it to you? Because maybe this just sounded like another newscast. But I want you to think about what I just said. That the people of China are watching television and reading newspapers this week, and they're seeing reports about the upcoming Chinese attack on the United States of America. They're showing on Chinese television how Chinese submarines will take out West Coast cities. They're naming the cities, Seattle, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco. They're estimating that the death toll will be 12 million people. They're showing how ICBMs will come over the North Pole and take out New England and the East Coast. They also said that the Midwest of the United States of America will not be attacked. Now, the reason I'm stopping with uh, our regular newscast at this point is because the audience of True News has grown tremendously this year. I have no idea how many new people are listening. I just know that our audience has greatly expanded this year. And I have not, I have not shared with our new listeners who I am and why I'm on the radio, and how this radio ministry started. I'm not a newsman. I'm not a professional newsman. Uh, I'm a watchman. And God interrupted my life 16 years ago and told me to be a watchman. God sovereignly put me on the radio, starting in Dallas-Fort Worth, May 24th, 1999, as a watchman. And then several months later, he told me, I'm going to stretch your faith. You're going to build your own studio. And this program is going to go national. And that happened very quickly. And I've been on the radio ever since. But for those of you who are fairly new to this program, and you've just started listening in 2013, you really don't know the history of True News, and you don't know my history, and you don't know why I'm here and why I'm doing this. And I want to take this time in this opening segment of the program to tell you why. In the 1990s, I was working as the director of marketing for TBN, and I was hired by uh, Dr. Paul Crouch who, by the way, is still in the hospital, and I I ask everybody to pray for his recovery. His uh, heart has been failing him, and he's hospitalized in a Dallas hospital. But anyhow, I was working uh, for TBN as the marketing director, and uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was the most challenging and adventurous uh, job I had ever had. And I was uh, traveling all over the United States, meeting with cable company executives and negotiating contracts and plotting strategy to market TBN to be uh, acceptable to cable television networks and to gain uh, cable uh, coverage in many cities. And, And I was extremely busy. 
And in March of 1998, the Holy Spirit began nudging me and impressing upon me that he wanted me to go on a fast. And I was actually so busy serving the Lord that I didn't have time to fast. I I know none of you have ever been in that position in your life where you're working, serving the Lord, and you're so busy you don't have time to pray or fast. Well, that's where I was at. I was busy. I, my, I had to pedal to the metal. I was going nonstop. And uh, fasting, you know, requires a lot of um, dedication. And I was, you know, I was traveling all, all over the country, and I had, uh, you know, I had dinner and luncheons with executives, and I was in conventions and trade shows and on planes traveling. And it's just very difficult to be fasting when you're doing all those things. But the Lord just kept dealing with me to fast, and finally, in sometime. I think it was around um, the third week of April, nineteen ninety-eight. I went. I finally just said, "Okay, I'm going to fast. I'm going to, I'm going to be here in the office and in, uh, in Irving, Texas, for the next week or two. So I'm going to go on a fast. I'll, I'll do it." And and so somewhere around the third or fourth day of the fast, around two o'clock in the afternoon, I felt this just this heavy presence of the Holy Spirit telling me to go to the chapel. And uh, and so I, I told the receptionist I, I was going to be gone from my desk for a few minutes and, you know, hold my calls. I'll be back. And yeah, I walked down to the chapel, and, and the heaviness was so strong. And I, I remember thinking, what is it? Why I've never felt the Lord come on me such with such heaviness. What is this? And I remember thinking, Wow, maybe he's going to tell me I have cancer and I'm going to die. I mean, this is like really, really heavy. Well, when I went into the chapel, there was nobody there. And I didn't see anybody. I didn't hear anything. But the chapel was absolutely filled with the presence of the holiness of God. It was his holiness. And I was aware that I was in the presence of the holy God of the universe. And if you think that you're going to jump up and down with joy and shout and run around because the presence of God is in the room, let me tell you, it's just the opposite. I felt as naked as Adam hiding in the garden trying to get away from the Lord. I mean, I was a naked man in the presence of a holy God. And I was, I was absolutely shaking, realizing my carnality as a human being, that, I, that in my own right, I have, no, I have no right to be in the presence of the creator of the universe. And so he really got my attention. And I realized this is very serious. And it was like, it was like all of my my sins, my failures, my my weaknesses, my carnality. It was just like it was it was written on the ceilings of the of the chapel and the walls. I mean it was like, oh, this is I just feel so um vulnerable in front of the Lord and he was showing me the things that were in me that, that were unpleasing to the Holy Spirit. And and so I was I was weeping and repenting, and very aware of, of of just my gross carnality as a person, and and the Lord graciously forgave me and restored me, and and as this was going on, at this this time with God, um, something happened. Suddenly, it was like a movie screen appeared in front of me. I saw it. I was standing up. I saw it. It was right in front of me. And I wasn't dreaming. I wasn't hallucinating. I was standing there and I could see it. It's like a movie screen in front of me. And I saw American cities on fire. I saw skyscrapers burning. I saw cities burn to a crisp. I saw smoke rising from the remains of, of cities. 
and I saw refugees, Americans. These were Americans. They were they were they were straggling out of these urban centers and they were walking along roads and through fields and they they looked stunned and dazed and they couldn't even comprehend what happened and uh, comprehend that they were still alive, that they had survived what happened. And and I remember the look on their faces and some were were carrying children and others were were uh, helping uh, senior citizens, elderly people along. It was just a horrific image. And I said, God, what am I seeing? What is this? And I heard in my spirit, this is your nation's future if America doesn't repent. And uh, I said, what am I supposed to do, Father? Why are you showing this to me? And then I heard this. Just as I brought your sins to your face in one moment, so too will I bring America's sins to her face in one moment. And I said, Father, what am I supposed to do? Why are you showing this to me? And he said, because today I'm calling you to warn your nation to repent. I'm going to judge this nation for its gross sins. And he um, he spoke to me there that day in the chapel, and, and I I said, what am I supposed to say? I, I don't know what I, you're calling me, but what am I supposed to say? And he said, tell the people to repent. And he said, listen to this. He said, I've declared a sin amnesty. And I said, Father, I've never heard of a sin amnesty. What is a sin amnesty? And, he, and I'm hearing this conversation with the Lord, and he said, what's an amnesty? And I said, that's when the government says, if you, if you voluntarily confess your wrongdoing, the laws that you've broken, turn yourself in voluntarily. Uh, the government will uh, forgive all of the transgressions, and your record will be cleaned, and they will act like you never did it. And the Lord said, and what happens if you don't turn yourself in? I said, well, if, if the amnesty ends and you didn't turn yourself in and you get caught, it's twice as bad. And he said, tell the people that. Tell them that I have offered America. Tell the, tell the world that I have offered them a sin amnesty. That if they just come to me and confess what they have done, if they would just confess that they're breaking my commandments, if they'll turn themselves in voluntarily, I will wash away their transgressions and I will act like they never did it and it will be new. And so I, I said, Father, I'll, I, I will do it. I said, but you know, I'm not the right person. I'm not the right person for this job. Don't, don't you remember what happened here just earlier when I came into this chapel? Do you remember the sins that you showed me in my life? Do you remember all this stuff? I'm not the right person to go out here and preach this message. You've got to find somebody who's holy. And the Lord said to me, I didn't choose you for this job because you're holy. I chose you because you're a good repenter. When I convict you, you repent. Tell the people to do the same thing. When I convict them, tell them to repent. Well, I went back to my desk. I didn't say a word to anybody. I mean, I was, I zipped my lips. I was so shaken. I didn't tell anybody at TBN. I went home that evening, and we were living in Colleyville at that time, and I, and I went home, and I never said a word to my wife, Susan. I didn't say anything to my son, Jeremy, and my daughter, Carissa. And uh, I, I was just real tight-lipped about it, very quiet. And the next morning, as I was preparing to go to work, my daughter Carissa said to me, and, and at that time she was she was 22 years old. She said, Dad, Jesus spoke to me in my sleep last night. And I said, what? She said, Jesus spoke to me in my sleep last night. I said, so you, you, you're telling me you had a dream about the Lord? She goes, no, I wasn't a dream. He spoke to me. He walked up to my bed and spoke to me. I said, you saw him? She said, I was asleep, but I knew he was standing by my bed speaking to me. I said, what did he say? And she said, he said, daughter, beginning tonight, 
I will speak to you about the last days through dreams and visions. And she said, Dad, he gave me a dream about the last days. And I said, what was it? And she said, Dad, you and Mom and and Jeremy and I were standing together. We were huddled together as a family, but we were surrounded by thousands of people. And they were rotating around us like they were on a, a giant carousel. But she said, Dad, listen to me. All the people were skeletons. And she said, I remember seeing the eye sockets in their skulls. I remember the the deathly look upon them. And she said, they were stretching out long, bony arms, and they were crying out to you with a loud voice saying, if you knew this was going to happen, why didn't you tell us? And my daughter looked at me and she said, Dad, I don't know what God is telling you to do, but you better do it. And at that moment, I told her what had happened to me the day before. And she goes, well, Dad, you you already know now. You know what you're supposed to do. This dream is the confirmation to you. You, you have to tell people what you saw in that vision. And so over the next several months of May, June, July, August of 1998, the Holy Spirit expanded on that vision and began to speak to me specific things. Now, again, remember, this is uh, the spring and summer of 1998, years before the September 11 attacks. And I was hearing in my spirit, Osama bin Laden, nuclear suitcase bombs, anthrax, agriterrorism, um, Islamic jihadist attacks, all this stuff. And I, and I wrote it down, and it's, it's verified that I wrote these things down. I spoke these things. And I began to tell people what the Holy Spirit was saying to me. And, and by the end of the summer of 1998, the burden on me was so great, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. And, and I went to Dr. Paul Crouch, and I, I gave him my resignation, and I said, I, I have to leave TBN because I have to tell the American people what God has told me to, to say. Now, I've got to be honest with you. At that time, it, it was so – it was so – I was so on fire with this, this vision and this message that I – I just assumed this is going to happen any day. This is going to happen like by the end of the year. I mean, I was absolutely burning with Holy Spirit zeal to tell people to repent, that God is going to judge the United States of America. In fact, when I went on the radio the following year, 1999, and I was saying on Dallas-Fort uh, Worth Radio in the summer of 1999, I said, you know, I said a number of times, <clears throat> I would say, I don't know what this means, but when I'm praying, I keep hearing the Lord say, judgment starts in America on September 11. And again, because of the, of the burning fire in me, you know, your, your, your human mind, your human reasoning thinks, well, it's got to be this September 11. It's got to be this year. But of course, it wasn't. The Lord was showing me. He was showing me things that were going to come in the future and that it was going to it was going to come in incremental stages. I was not surprised on September 11, 2001 when the World Trade Centers and and the, and the Pentagon were attacked. For me, I had been expecting something. And suddenly it was there September 11 and I realized, wow. When the Lord was saying judgment starts in America on September 11, it wasn't for 1999. It wasn't for that immediate time. It was in the future. But I knew that day. I, I, I had this chilling awareness, realization on September 11, 2001. This is the beginning of the fulfillment of the vision God gave me in April 1998. And I realized at that time it's going to happen over Many years. It's going to come in stages. And so here we are now, 2013. 
And look at the condition we're in. America is more sinful than it ever was on September 10, 2001, before the attacks. We're more sinful now than when the attacks happened. We have gone farther away from God. We have embraced homosexuality. We have embraced occultism. We have embraced every wicked thing you can imagine. We have not moved towards God. We've moved away from Him. So judgment is certain now. It is certain because there are no signs of repentance in America, including in the church. The church is cold. The church is ice cold. It is indifferent. It is unaware. It has no comprehension that the end of this nation is nigh. I didn't tell you that day in the chapel, as I asked the Lord to give me a confirmation that the vision I was seeing was from him, I said, Father, show me something in your word that confirms this vision is from you. And I opened my Bible and I was looking at Isaiah 24. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants, and it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servants, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. The land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered. For the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. The new wine fails, the vine languishes, all the merry hearted sigh, the mirth of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the jubilant ends the joy of the harp ceases they shall not drink wine with a song strong drink is bitter to those who drink it the city of confusion is broken down every house is shut up so that none may go in there is a cry for wine in the streets all joy is dark and the mirth of the land is gone in the city desolation is left and the gate is stricken with destruction When it shall be thus in the midst of the land among the people, it shall be like the shaking of an olive tree, like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is gone. So when I read to you today that the Chinese people are watching on TV and reading in their newspapers advanced details of the nuclear attack on the United States of America, I am not surprised I am grieved in my heart. I am broken and saddened because great destruction is coming, great heartache, much death. Tens of millions of people shall die because of the sins of this nation, because of the sins of her priest, because her priest and her pastors are full of wickedness and sinfulness themselves. And it's because of the sinfulness of the pastors that a breach will be found in the defensive wall of this nation, and the enemy shall enter in because the pastors, the shepherds, are sinning and have fallen asleep themselves. My friend, if you have sin in your life, repent, 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 repent. If you've never been born again, Believe on the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Confess your sins to God Almighty. Cry out for the name of Jesus Christ to save you. Believe on his name. And if you are a Christian who is messing with sin, by all means, repent. Repent and beg of the Lord to forgive you and to restore you before this judgment strikes the nation. Please do not ignore the warnings that God is giving you and this nation. I mean, don't go into a, you know, into a a sleep where you pretend that these news reports aren't real. The Chinese are openly talking 
about nuking this nation. Could it be this year? Maybe. Next year? Possibly. Could this be two or three years away? I don't know. I just know that it's in the news in China that they're talking and preparing the Chinese people for a nuclear war with the United States of America. Imagine if in the United States you're watching CNN and they're telling you that the Pentagon is preparing to nuke Chinese cities, Beijing, Shanghai, and other cities. I mean, what would you be thinking? So don't don't ignore this stuff. If you have never been born again, if your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, please make this right with God right now. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I cry out to you, and I declare that I am a sinner. I have broken your commandments, and I deserve death and punishment. But I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, as the Messiah, as the Savior, to forgive my sins. And so I believe upon his name, and I repent of my sins, and I ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life and to save me. Now, Father, write my name in the book of life and spare my soul and save me in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And my friend, if you're a Christian and you're caught up in sin, please repent. You have the power through the Holy Spirit to repent. You can do it. Stop it. Turn from your sin now, lest you be caught up in the flames of judgment coming to this land. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, this is True News. This is Max McLean. Is it important to take God's judgment seriously? Listen to the Bible from 2 Peter 2. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous, for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. From 2 Peter 2. Listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing. Be able to hear the Word of God today and every day. To hear more, go to radiobible.org. Well, you're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. Long-range weather forecaster Dr. Pierce Corbin from Great Britain was on True News earlier this week. He and I discussed various recent weather events that hint that our planet may be entering a long period of global cooling. Not global warming, but global cooling. I mentioned uh, about the 100,000 cattle that froze to death in South Dakota at the beginning of October during an unexpected blizzard that dropped up to 50 inches of snow. I also mentioned that a sudden, unexpected, severe frost in Chile damaged over 65 million boxes of fruit destined to be exported to the USA and Canada and other nations. Chilean fruit producers said the frost damage was extensive and that consumers in America and Canada should expect to see fruit shortages in stores and much higher prices later this month. The same story is being reported from Australia. Severe, widespread, and successive frost have ruined hundreds of thousands of hectares of crop across New South Wales and Victoria. Frost damage to cherries, plums, prunes, peaches, nectarines, and strawberries is described as substantial, as high as 80% in some regions. The entire crop of wheat and canola and grapes has been completely destroyed in some parts of those regions also. The BBC recently published an interview with Reading University professor Mike Lockwood, who is warning that an unprecedented decline in solar activity, namely sunspots, is a warning that there is a growing risk the Earth may experience a mini ice age. Two Dutch scientists from the Space Research Organization of the Netherlands published a report this week that analyzed the dependence of global Earth temperature 
on the sun's magnetic fields instead of gauging it on the number of sunspots. The scientists said the uh, sun has two big magnetic areas uh, at the equator and the uh, polar region by including both areas. The scientists show that from the year 1610 till the first half of the 20th century, the variation of the Earth's temperature, they said, is mainly due to the sun. Wow, what a what a radical conclusion to come to. Meanwhile, President Barack Obama issued an executive order on Friday directing U.S. federal agencies to boost preparation in U.S. states and communities to cope with the impact of global warming. The presidential order said the impacts of climate change, including an increase in prolonged periods of excessively high temperatures, heavy downpours, Increase in wildfires, severe droughts, uh, permafrost thawing, ocean acidification, and sea level rise are already affecting communities, natural resources, ecosystems, economies, and public health across the nation. Shutting down coal-fired power plants is part of Mr. Obama's strategy to defeat global warming. And let's not leave out former Vice President Al Gore. He is warning that the world is on the brink of the largest bubble ever in the realm of finance. It is the carbon bubble. Mr. Gore said the world is sitting on $7 trillion of stranded carbon <laughs> stranded carbon assets, uh, namely oil refineries, coal mines, and fossil fuel power stations. Mr. Gore is demanding that corp- corporations and investors publicly identify carbon risk in their investment portfolios before these carbon-stranded assets bring down the global financial system. Uh, they are calling on uh, companies, uh, as I said, to to uh, come clean and tell uh, everybody about the carbon assets that they are hiding in their portfolios. Uh, here to discuss the insanity of the global warming propaganda delusion is Mr. Klaus Kaiser. He's the author of nearly 200 publications in scientific journals, government and national and international agency reports, books, trade magazines, and newspapers. He has served as president of the Association for Great Lakes Research. He is currently director of research for Terra Base Incorporated, and he is a fellow of the Chemical Institute of Canada. He's the author of the book, Convenient Myths. His website is convenientmyths.com. Mr. Kaiser, welcome to True News. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Well, have you? do you stay awake at night worrying about stranded carbon assets? No, uh, that is a rather new term, and I'm still trying to figure out what it actually is supposed to mean. Yes, yes. Well, Mr. Gore said it could bring down the entire global financial system. Well, I think it's another myth. Um, I, I always thought oil companies and uh, refineries and power plants and, you know, things like that, I thought those were investment assets. Yeah, I would agree with you. Just look at the world. Uh, a few hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, all mankind uh, had to use to heat their homes and have uh, any uh, uh, warms was wood. Well, then uh, we discovered big uh, coal deposits have been using those, and they led, in a way, together with technology, uh, to the big industrial revolution. Since then, oil was uh, discovered, and as of late, and, you know, several decades now, we also use quite a bit of natural gas. These are all one or another form of carbon. The world cannot proceed without that. We can uh, replace some of that energy with uh, various other sources. We use hydro, uh, we use uh, nuclear power, and uh, to some minuscule scale, wind and solar power. Uh, There's talk about uh, using ocean wave energy and the like, but uh, these uh, are not likely to ever be able to come anywhere near the amount of energy that we get and need from coal and other carbon sources. Mr. Geiser, what motivates people like Al Gore? Are they naive and they really believe the global warming shtick, or do they have a sinister motive? Well, I think uh, they certainly have... uh, 
motives uh, which are not quite in keeping what what they sell. Uh, I view them somewhat as snakes oil salesmen, and um, they're out to enrich themselves for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, whether they also have some conviction along the line, I can't really say. Mm -hmm. I would be surprised if they did. And Mr. Gore has become fabulously wealthy yes. fighting global warming. Oh, yes, yeah. And I think this latest thing about the carbon bubble is just trying to perpetuate this uh, whole nonsense, I must say, about the bad things of uh, carbon dioxide is supposed to do. Well, perhaps he's going to ask corporations to, to donate their stranded carbon assets to some foundation that he controls. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And then he'll he'll have mega wealth of all these stranded carbon assets. Um, wh where and when did this carb uh, did this global warming mantra get started? Well, it sort of got started with uh, uh, the um, the UN uh, and um, the creation of the intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change. That was a couple of decades ago. Uh, at that point, uh, Gore and others tried to uh, convince the world that the world was heating up, uh, climate was changing, uh, and uh, it could be actually true, and it could be, if it were to be true, related to carbon dioxide. And... Um, that was uh, an idea which actually is uh, 200 years old uh, by some uh, Swedish scientist, but that was later, already 100 years ago, refuted. So uh, anyway, uh, in the late 70s, thereabouts, uh, this idea had mysteriously reappeared and was reinvigorated by politicians like Mr. Gore. Do, do you believe, does the sun and, and the earth have, do they operate on a rhythmic cycle? Oh, definitely. There are all kinds of uh, cycles which determine our climate on earth. Uh, for example, the sunspots. They are have been looked at and measured for thousands of years already. And... Um, from all these observations, it is quite clear that uh, typically is an 11-year sunspot cycle. And from those observations, it has been uh, recognized that, for example, uh, global temperatures uh, are somewhat related to the number of sunspots. So if the sunspots decrease, then globally we get colder temperatures. That has been shown in the Middle Ages, in the 1600s to early 1700s, when uh, there was a so-called mon minimum in the sunspots. And that period coincided with very brutal cold temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere, Europe, and also North America, but uh, Europe was mostly affected. And many people starved to death because... Uh, the crops did not ripen, and other failures, and of course, the brutal cold. Now, in the opening of this of this segment, I mentioned, you know, the the blizzard that hit South Dakota October first, killing a hundred thousand head of cattle, and then uh, there were uh, severe frost in Chile in September, wiped out sixty five million boxes of fruit. Uh, they said there's going to be. Uh, severe shortages of fruit in the United States and Canada in the stores this winter, very high prices. Same thing is happening in Australia. Uh, some places, 80 to 100 percent destruction of the crop by by successive severe frost. When you hear those kind of reports, d does that make you sit up and, and take notice that perhaps uh, we are witnessing a return of a cooling cycle? Oh, yes, definitely. And in fact... Um I just uh, came across another report today. Uh, according to Rutgers University, uh, the global snow lab there, um, this year, 
for the first time, I think, ever, the um, um, snowfall in the month of October has uh, dumped more snow in the northern hemisphere than in the last 50 years. And uh, at the moment, the 900,000 square miles of uh, Siberia and northern Canada covered in snow versus a 50-year average of roughly half that amount. That's new information. I've not heard this. Uh, but but all this uh, it seems to be adding up this year. Oh, definitely. That, that there is definitely a, a change in the weather pattern. Now, do, do you... Um, I'm assuming you you don't deny that that the planet was warming, but you, what you what you um, what you challenge is that it was caused by man-made activity. Is that correct? Um, well, yes and no. Okay. Let me explain that. Um, man-made activity could involve all kinds of things, mm-hmm. and when. I say, for example, man has an influence on one thing or another. Uh, That doesn't mean at all that it is connected whatsoever with carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Now, what I mean by that, for example, um, if, if we were to cut down all the trees in Florida and pave all of Florida over with uh, concrete or asphalt, uh, the climate there would change. The local climate in the area would change because much of the rain and water which gets evaporated by trees and from uh, water bodies, that cools the surrounding air. But if you have all that rain, for example, and water drain extremely fast into the ocean, then there is no water left to cool the air. So that is a man-made influence, but it has nothing to do whatsoever with carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. But let me give you some other example, if I may, um, which I think is a a very interesting uh, uh, series of measurements which have been uh, undertaken uh, daily by the Danish Meteorological Institute. And they have a number of measuring stations in the far north. And uh, since 1957, these measurements have resulted in a very uh, steady kind of curve, uh, which rises from, uh, and uh, the days are numbered by day of year from a minimum in around day 50 to a maximum around the middle of the year and then declines again. And they have measured the number of frost-free days in the latitude north of 80 degrees north. And over all these 55 years, it has never been much different than about 90 days. This year, in 2013, the uh, number of these first three days was 45. So half what the long-term average was. And that coincides with these other observations of uh, uh, snow and in Siberia and uh, frost uh, in uh, Australia and the other ones you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when do you when do you think that the we're really going to start to see evidence of a uh, mini ice age or a severe cooling cycle? Well, it might be just around the corner. Mm-hmm. Um, Possibly possibly the winter of of 2013-2014? Yes, quite possibly. Uh, The last few winters in in, in recent years in in Europe have been uh, rather cold. uh, uh, Despite all predictions to the contrary uh, by the British Meteorological Office and others, Snow has not disappeared from those areas. In fact, they had uh, severe winters. You may recall there were 
very funny uh, observations uh, from the um, airport in London. A couple of people leaning on a shuffle trying to clear the runway. Um, so uh, it could well happen again, and uh, uh, it depends on uh, nature's caprios. So uh, it can be warm one day and, and snowy the next, but uh, basically... Already this year, there are indications that uh, we're going to have a cold winter. I think, I, I, you know, I've been talking about this on the program for a number of years. I've, I've interviewed uh, various climatologists and solar scientists and talking about four or five years ago that they said that they were watching the sun for signs of a, uh, of, a of an impending ice age. And... Uh, but this year, I've really stepped up my conversations on this program about the real possibility of a mini ice age. But I think, Mr. Kaiser, I think I'm falling short in in conveying to our radio audience just how cold it can become during a mini ice age. I think a lot of people are thinking, oh, okay, it's uh, you know, so we're going to have a couple winters where the snow is really deep, and you know, we get some cold snaps. And but that's not it. When I when I read the historical accounts of of the last mini ice age. In North America and in Europe, I mean, it's frightening to me because I I see how the weather, how the temperatures plunge suddenly, and large numbers of people froze to death, and 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 a high mortality rate among livestock and food production wiped out. It's it's quite uh, frightening when you read the historical accounts of how severe it can become quickly. Yes, indeed. Uh, that, I think, can be a real surprise if uh, we get uh, such a period. Uh, the, um, especially in the northern hemisphere, in the, let's say, and in the uh, area above 45 degrees uh, uh, latitude. For example, that was more or less the boundary of the great uh, uh, ice age uh, ice shields in North America and Europe. So north of here, we had anywhere between one and two miles high ice. And that all disappeared, and who knows, it may be (laughs) coming back faster than we think. It starts out with snow. You get heavy snowfalls, and uh, then you get just shorter periods of uh, of uh, summer and and less melting, and it builds up quite rapidly. So I'm not saying that we're going to have a mile of ice here tomorrow, but uh, we could be on the way to it. Mm-hmm. If you look at geological timescales, uh, it could take uh, ten or a hundred years, but uh, to build up, uh, but it could happen rather rather rapidly if the sun uh, radiation we get uh, suddenly uh, is much less. Well, and this, you know, I, men- I mentioned, you know, the BBC report with uh, Professor Lockwood from Reading University. He said last week that that um, their observation of of the decline of sunspot activity shows that this is the most rapid rate of decline known in scientific history. Yes, I've I've read this report, and in fact, uh, oh, a couple of months ago or so, uh, NASA also predicted that uh, uh, we are going to experience several decades of below normal sunspot activity. So. Uh, that uh, will be seen how how that works out. Uh, what, what do you what do you think people like Al Gore and, and the Global Warming Choir? What are they going to do? Are they just going to go away, or do you think are they going to find a way to spin it and 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 profit from it? They will keep going as long as as uh, they can. Facts really don't matter for these people because they are bent on selling. Uh, uh, a belief, it is more, you could almost call it a religious belief, uh, that uh, we're all going to fly in hell or something. Uh, facts don't matter to them. I agree. And it is religious. 
There yeah. really it is like a a global warming religion because it's tied together with a lot of other things, including population control and 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 global governance. And there's you know when you when you start connecting all the dots, you you realize hey they have a global agenda in, yeah. in this. Uh, global warming propaganda campaign. It's not just talking about the environment. They want to use it to implement a lot of other things. Well, Mr. Kleiser, I appreciate you being on True News today. My guest, uh, Klaus uh, Kla- uh, Kaiser, he is the author of the book Convenient Myths, and his website is convenientmyths.com. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Who's in charge of the church? Jesus is. Here's today's moment with Charles Stanley. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is deity, and the Bible says that he's the head of the church, you already have a major problem in what you believe, a major problem in your church, and a major problem about how you would carry out the work. Because you've got somebody in charge who's not God. Is he always right or is he not always right? Listen, you cannot deviate from one single portion of the Word of God. If you do, you get yourself in trouble. It's like dominoes. You may say, well, this isn't, I don't have to believe this. But what you have to ask is, what falls in the sequence? Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is the son of the living God. He's the founder of the church. What did he say? He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. And so Christ is not only the head of the church, he's the head of the church because he established the church. It was his idea. He is the one who builds the church. And so we talk about building churches today. People talk about building the church. They may, we may build buildings. It is only God who builds the church because the church is not a building. Churches are people. Of all the religious things out there to have an opinion about, what you believe about Jesus matters for eternity. Learn more when you click All Things Are New at InTouch.org. Well, we're at the, uh, the end of the program, and I want to thank you so much for spending this hour with me. I like to, to end programs by reading the Word of God, and I'm going to end today's program from Psalms 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth may be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. Just at the break of dawn, the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth, who has, makes war cease to end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob, our salvation.